Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all our dear brothers and sisters who are joining in from across the globe. My name is Tom Jacob, and I'm a member of Kargar Brethren Assembly, Nayu Mumbai. On behalf of TERC, I would like to welcome all of you once again. Thank you for your uh, interest and time that you have taken out to study from the Word of God. And special warm greetings and welcome to our dear brother David Matthew, who is joining from uh, Detroit, Michigan. And a quick word of introduction uh, before we get into our session on our dear brother. So our dear brother David comes from a very godly family. And uh, in fact, our dear uncle Joy has testified that he has seen him grow uh, right from his childhood days, uh, building up his knowledge in divine nature, in, in divine studies. And uh, he has been testified that he's a very useful blessing and a good vessel for the local assembly in Detroit, Michigan. So we are very glad to have you, our dear brother, uh, in the midst of us, and especially teaching us from the word of God. And well, once again, welcoming you, dear brother, in the midst of uh, us. So today's topic is abiding in the Lord, and we look forward to hear from you, dear brother. Uh, also, we'd like to welcome Brother Noble John. We're very glad to have our dear brother in the midst of us. God has answered our prayers. He's joining from Santa Cruz, Mumbai, and uh, who would be giving us a brief summary and a prayer towards the end. So let us start our today's session uh, with a word of prayer, and uh, then I'll hand over to our dear brother David. Let us bow down. Our Heavenly Gracious Father, we thank you and praise your God for giving us this wonderful opportunity once again in our lives. Lord God, to be gathered around your feet, to learn from your scriptures. And once again, Lord God, thank you for the privilege that we enjoy as your children. Lord God, what a privilege to be called your children in this end times, to learn from the word of God, Lord God, in, in the midst of the perishing heathen. And Lord God, thank you for the love that you have shown towards us through your son and in redeeming us, in choosing us and having this great, making us part of this great plan that you had for mankind, Lord God. Thank you that today as we have gathered here under the banner of TERC, Lord God, thank you that you have brought our dear servant in the midst of us. And thank you for the testimony. Thank you for all the knowledge that you have helped him grow in. Pray that Lord, as we sit around this medium, you may help him to expound from the scriptures. Help us also, Lord God, as we hear from him, that we may, Lord God, have our hearts and our ears open. Lord God, help us to reflect, help us to cleanse, help us to study, help us to grow, Lord God. We pray for all our dear brothers and sisters who are still joining in. Pray that, Lord, you may help them to join at the earliest so that they don't miss the word. We pray for the medium. We pray for all the technical uh, uh, requirements of this meeting, Lord God. There may not be any obstacles. You may help us all to hear the word of God uh, without any problems till the end, Lord God. Once again, submitting our dear servant into your hands. Pray that thou might bless him, lead him, and guide him, Lord. Submitting today's session into your presence, Lord, as we submit this prayer in the most highly exalted name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Over to you, dear brother. Good evening. Thank you, Brother Tom. First of all, greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I count it a privilege to be with you all this morning, morning for you, nighttime for me, uh, to bring before you the word of God, and also to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus. I count it a privilege and a big responsibility to minister from the word of the living God. So I don't intend to just pass on some information as much as the words of the living God. And my prayer is that God would speak to us. I want to especially thank those who have prayed for me in the preparation because I don't want to speak from my mind, but I want the Lord to guide us and I continue to look to him for guidance. I also want to thank the responsible brethren uh, at TRC, uh, the leadership team for giving me the invitation and uh, giving me the privilege of magnifying the Lord uh, in the sharing of the word. So I would like to share my screen. Uh, the topic before us, as was mentioned, is to abide in the Lord. So I'm gonna briefly share my screen. I hope my audio is good and that you're able to see my screen as well. Yes, okay, I assume so. So, yeah, fine. Just, yes, good, thank you. 
So to start off, I would like to read John chapter 15. It is one of the most fundamental passages for New Testament believers to understand what it means to abide in the Lord and what blessings it brings to our lives and what riches are hidden in this aspect of abiding in the Lord. This is a passage that is primarily to believers. And I understand that most of us on this call here are believers. So I trust the Lord will bless the meditation of his word. So I would like to read uh, very quickly, not too many verses here, John 15 verses one through 11. And let's pay attention and may the Lord open our understanding that we would understand his word. John 15 verses one through 11. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what evil, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that he bear much fruit, so shall he be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. These are verses picked up from a very unique gospel in the Bible, the gospel of John. And just to refresh our memory and to recap a few things, few important things. First of all, John, as directed by the Holy Spirit, wrote the gospel with a very explicit purpose. It is the only book written explicitly that men might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. John's desire was, through the Holy Spirit, to present the Lord Jesus Christ in such a fashion that we would see the living, risen Christ through his life as he lived here on the earth. We know the Apostle John is not the author of just the Gospel of John, but he wrote three epistles, and he also wrote the book of Revelation each of them very rich in, in their own aspects. So I would like very quickly for us to consider some of the big points that we see very uniquely in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John brings out the glory of the Lord Jesus right from the first verse. It describes the Lord as the one who was in the beginning, in the beginning, and it starts just like you would see in the very first lines of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. And here John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And we're taken to a time or a state when nothing existed, but there was God and the Lord Jesus was always there. He was in the beginning with God and we read all things were made by him and without him was not made anything that was made. He's the absolute creator. And he's given this fundamental title by John, very unique, called the Word. And we see that title being repeated also in the book of Revelation, so tightly integrated to what God is trying to communicate to man. And he spoke finally through his son. As we read in the book of Hebrews, God spoke to mankind through prophets and different means, but it was all in bits and pieces. And the final revelation, the full and the perfect revelation came to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we prayerfully go through the Gospel of John, 
we will encounter so many precious titles and identity of the Lord Jesus. It's just breathtaking to our human soul to come so close and view the divine person of the Lord Jesus. We see him, as already mentioned, the word of God. And then we see John's ministry. And very clearly, John, as he writes the gospel, says that he was not that light, but he was sent by God. And what did John do as part of his ministry? He points to the Lord Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Very recently, we witnessed scores and millions of people coming together for one purpose, to see their sins being washed away. It happened in our country. We all know the incident. But there is only one person who has come to take away the sin of the world, and that is the Lord Jesus. He's the one who has manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Again, that we see in 1 John. And we see the Lord Jesus as a teacher who taught very profound things about life. Man tries to give a definition to life, and he gives us life to all kinds of pursuits, be it uh, entertainment or be it technology or in or some field of science or great knowledge but the lord jesus gives us the true understanding of life and why is that because he is life himself and so when the lord taught he taught with authority and not only did he teach his life is even today and will never be surpassed as the greatest example he was not just somebody who spoke but his life itself is the greatest lesson that we could ever have. And so we see that John the Baptist, as he introduces the Lord, he gives these precious words of testimony to the Lord Jesus, saying that he is above all. We are all of the earth, but he is above all. And then he says that he must increase and I must decrease. What an attitude for this man whose whole purpose being sent by God was to reveal the Messiah and he is happy and he rejoices to see that glory goes to this Messiah, to the anointed one, to the son of God. And what a moment it must have been for John as John the Baptist, as he baptized the Lord Jesus, heavens opened up. And this was a sign that the Lord had promised, God had promised to John that he on whom you see the spirit descending, he is the Messiah. And John testifies that Jesus is the Messiah. And he hears a voice from heavens, heavens torn apart, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And by that time, the Lord Jesus had not yet embarked on a public ministry yet. He had spent those 30 years in relative obscurity in his hometown in Nazareth, making occasional trips to Jerusalem. But in everything, he was so well-pleasing to the father that the father says, this is my beloved son. Look at the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus. And later, John in his gospel says, just by believing in him, just by receiving him, we are born again. We have eternal life. We shall never perish. It is all available to us just simply by believing in him. And you should do a word count on the number of times the word believe is used in the gospel of John over and over and over again. Our salvation, the gift of eternal life is not available to anybody by merit. It is only available purely on the basis of faith given to us by grace, paid for in full by the Lord Jesus himself in his lifeblood. May we never demean this gospel of free salvation by adding any sort of work to it. John never puts that anywhere in there. We get salvation purely as a gift. Let it remain a gift and let all glory go to the living God who through his son made a way for us to be his eternally. And then we see the Lord Jesus in John chapter 5 being introduced as the judge of all the earth. He says, the father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the son. And what a shock and a surprise it would be to the world that takes the name of the Lord in vain as a curse word to find him on the judgment throne, judging them. 
and determining their eternal destiny. What a shock that would be. The Lord Jesus, he humbled himself and came down as a man, but he's not a mere man. He is in the beginning, always was God, is God, will be God, and he will be revealed in all his glory. In the glory of the Father with the angels, he is going to be revealed. The world will be shocked, surprised, as it says in the book of Revelation. They will wail and mourn, and there will still be rebellious people who would not want him. So this Lord Jesus is going to be your and my judge. We are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, each of us, to give an account to him. And he will be the judge. He will determine, not our fellow believers, as well-intentioned as they might be. My case will be taken up uniquely, and so will, be, so will yours be. We see that in the book of Romans. We see that in 1 Corinthians as well. So let us not be surprised. The one that we are dealing with is the most high one who came down as a man, humbled himself out of his love and abundance of mercy and grace. And the Gospel of John, I have to keep going. The Gospel of John also describes the seven, many items in, in, um, in increments of seven. For example, the Gospel of John talks about the seven sayings of the Lord that are I am. I am and a metaphor or some kind of an object to give us an understanding of who the Lord Jesus is. The Lord Jesus cannot be described in just one or two sentences. He's so vast, all encompassing that our minds just cannot understand. And to help us, the Lord revealed himself in various sayings as the I am. In one place, in John chapter 6, we are, we are all very familiar with it. The Lord says, I am the bread of life. I love this. The Lord says that if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. It's not like the manna that people ate and died. It's not a physical food, but it's a metaphorical language. You eat that bread and you will live forever. You will never hunger in John chapter 6, verse 35. And then the Lord says that I am the light of the world. This is a very powerful metaphor from a spiritual sense because there is darkness everywhere. We see darkness even inside of us. We're still in the flesh. We still battle sin. But he is the light of the world. And when we follow him, we will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And John takes this and expands on this in one John, where he says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we testify that there is no darkness in him, which means that he was absolutely pure and full of light. Look at this person, the Lord Jesus, how glorious he is. And then we go on to read the Lord Jesus saying that I am the door. If you enter by me, you will be saved. I love this. There's that one door you go by, by faith, and you have eternal life. Another I am saying is found in John 10. The Lord Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is more than just caring for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep to the point that the sheep can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. I shall not want. I will not because the Lord is my shepherd. He has met all my needs. What I don't have, it's not for me. What I have, he has given it to me. I'm always content in him. And so I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then the Lord Jesus says, Standing at the grave of Lazarus, who else could utter these words? I am the resurrection and life. Just think about it. These words would have been so hollow if he came to the funeral party, met with Martha and Mary, joined with them in, in their grief, and then comforted them and simply walked away. But what does the Lord do? He asked the people, to roll the stone away, just to make it real for our context. It would be like asking somebody to go dig up the grave of somebody who has been buried for four days. And the sisters say, no, no, don't do that. His body is stinking. But the Lord said, have I not told you? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. And then the Lord Jesus brings Lazarus back to life. It is in that context that the Lord says, I am the resurrection and, and the life. And he says, 
he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Haven't we experienced that life that came to us when we were still dead in sins and trespasses? Lazarus experienced a physical coming back to life, but he died again. But we have experienced spiritual resurrection, and we're awaiting someday for a physical resurrection. Those who are dead in Christ first, and then us, we will be transformed. Look at the riches that we find in the Lord Jesus. Who can compare to the Lord? And then we read in John 14, the Lord Jesus says that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How absolute are these words? How final are these words? The Lord says that I am the way. Not only is he pointing to a way, he points to himself and he says, I am the way. And the Bible is filled with instructions of godly living. But here comes somebody who is the embodiment of the fullness of Godhead. In him dwells the fullness of Godhead bodily. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. These words cannot be explained fully, even in human language. That's how deep, though simple, very profound are these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then since he's in the Father, he uses the phrase that no man cometh to the Father. He doesn't say no man goeth to the Father. He says no man cometh to the Father, except but by me. And then John 15, the words that we just read, I am the wine. The Lord introduces himself as the true wine. And we will, as the Lord allows in the next couple sessions, we will dig deeper into that particular metaphor. There are also seven distinct miracles that John has recorded. He had in front of him thousands of miracles to pick up. But as the Holy Spirit guided him, he picked up seven miracles and they are recorded. I'll quickly mention them to you. We are all familiar with it, so I won't go in details of it. One is turning water into wine. That was the first miracle that the Lord did and showed his glory. It changed the entire wedding uh, party. They saw what the Lord did and his glory was seen. Then we see the healing of the nobleman's son. It was another amazing miracle seen in chapter 4. And then we see the Lord healing the one by the pool of Bethesda. He was sick for 38 years with no help, incapable of helping himself. The Lord comes along and heals him. Then we see the feeding of the 5,000. What an amazing miracle. This one is mentioned in all the four Gospels because this was no ordinary miracle. First time after the children of Israel made it through the wilderness into the land of Canaan, would bread be available so readily and freely? And then the Lord expands on that and introduces himself as the bread of life. That's John chapter 6. Then we see the Lord walking on the water to his disciples who were in utter dismay and in peril. And not only that, but the Lord calms the sea. We see that also in chapter 6. Then we see in chapter 9, the Lord giving sight to a man who was born blind, impossible otherwise. But the Lord, he was able to give him sight. What is impossible for the Lord? Through his life, he has demonstrated that he has power over creation, over all human situations. And what was impossible for you and me to be redeemed also would be made possible by this man, the Lord Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all. And then the last one we see is the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, proving that he is the author of life. He gives life and he is life. We read that in 1 John. He is life himself. And he is the one who gives abundant life. In John chapter 3, it reads towards the end. He, or 1 John, sorry, it says, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. How about the millions of people who go through life without the Lord Jesus? They are only living briefly before they die eternally. They are dead spiritually. And if they die in their sins, they have no life in them. But when we receive the Lord Jesus, 
we have eternal life. We have true life. All these interesting uh, comparisons and metaphors are important to bear in mind as we make our way to John chapter 15. There is often an eighth miracle that is talked about in parenthesis, which the disciples experienced. We can read about that in the last chapter of John after the resurrection of the Lord, where he, at his command, the disciples were able to bring in a big multitude of fish in a place where for hours prior through the night, they caught nothing. And so in this gospel, we meet the Lord Jesus and we see those whose lives were touched by the Lord Jesus, right from the religious uh, Nicodemus to the Samaritan woman who experienced such a quenching of her spiritual thirst that she brought the entire town to come and see this man, come see a man who told all things that I ever did. And those men, those people, they later testified, now we believe, not because of what you have said, but we have seen with our own eyes, we have understood him, and we confess that he is the savior of the world. We see this man who was born blind. All of these people came to an understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And by believing, they all received life through his name. It's a very complicated thing for us to understand eternal life. He made it so simple. He says, believe in me and you will have eternal life. It could not have been more simpler. A small child can receive eternal life and so can a wise and a very knowledgeable person as can the uneducated. All people have the ability to exercise faith, to believe and the Lord has made it available for all of us. For so reads John's gospel, chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world, he didn't hold it back. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This has been God's will. And he's still working out his plan in this world while we are going through this little session here. So it's good to keep in mind what God has accomplished through his son, what he's currently doing and what he is going to do. That'll give us an understanding of what, how should our lives be in the light of this precious unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus that God gave to us. He, and when he came, he gave himself completely to us. And John actually writes one more line, and then we will move on. John says that if we were to recount and write down every little thing that the Lord did, he says that the whole world could not contain it because the work of the Lord impacted so many people, and it still does to this time. But in heaven and in glory, we will see more and we will know more. But this is sufficient what John has written, that men may believe. I'm so happy to know that the gospel of John is what is presented to most people who are new to the faith or those who are still seeking. And I had a personal experience of reading the gospel of John many years ago and almost coming face to face with the risen Lord as I went through those pages. I would recommend that book to anybody who is seeking to know who the living God is. I understand that most of us are believers, but if there is any hungry heart that seeks to know who the creator is, well, you will find him in the gospel of John. Now, while all these things were going on for the Lord Jesus as his public ministry came into the third year, you can see a lot of tension building. Even while Lazarus was brought back to life, we can see that there was already a lot of tension. They wanted to kill Lazarus. They wanted to kill the Lord. They wanted to stone him. And so with the religious leaders planning and scheming, things have come to uh, a point where it is time for the Lord to leave this world. And he was not leaving because people were opposing him. This was the will of the Father in every little detail. And we know that the Lord Jesus often said uh, that my hour has not yet come. And John rec records that 
because his hour had not yet come, he did not die. The Lord Jesus came in due time. He died at the exact time as the Father determined. We know that. And the Gospel of John actually provides a very good section of view into the final hours of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus. So that is what we are going to consider. And then we will zoom into John chapter 15. So um, you might have often heard of um, leaders of big organizations, maybe the CEO or somebody who suddenly dies or has to leave the job and the whole organization falls uh, in a state of turmoil, trying to figure out how do we get this back to normal? And it's never quite the same. And that's how it is with human organizations. Um, and in a sense, the Lord Jesus, with his band of 12 disciples, of which one would be gone, how would they survive something as terrible as what they were yet to experience? Now, for us, we know the ending. We know how the Lord died. We know that he rose again. So we're not being anxious at all. I understand that. But if you look at it from the time, the standpoint of the disciples, they were completely terrified. They were troubled. They were sad. Their hearts were filled with sorrow. That's the context in which we find ourselves as we go through John's gospel, chapter 13. So we should not forget that as we keep that in mind. That will help us truly take the best benefit of what is mentioned in those chapters. So what does the Lord do during this time? In John chapter 13 uh, onwards, the Lord is having a conversation with his disciples. Instead of providing a lot of organizational planning, as we would expect with anybody, Take any human organization, even if it's a Christian organization, there'll be some direction, do this, do that. But look at what the Lord did. He simply pours out his heart of love to his disciples. And in the midst of all that deep agony and grief of our Savior that we cannot fully understand, he's actually concerned about his disciples. He is with the disciples and actually he calls them very tenderly. He calls them little children. We see that in John's gospel, chapter 13, towards the end. He really loved them. And that's how John chapter 13 actually begins. And I would like to read a couple of verses really quick to bring focus to, to what we are about to say. So when we look at John chapter 13, it reads like this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart, out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. What does the Lord do? Every word of his, every action of his, is motivated by love towards those disciples. They recognized it. John records it. He tells them how they should live even beyond his death. He's not saying that I'm going to die. This is the end. You go and find your own places in life and I hope all will be well with you but the Lord is preparing them he's strengthening them and he tells them how to live how to love and how to serve in his kingdom this is not the end he's going to come back he assures them do not be troubled I am coming back and then in many words he tells them that my peace I'm, I give to you can you imagine how that would have been for the disciples as with a troubled heart, they heard the Lord very peacefully and calmly assuring them. But the Lord had his own burden to carry, his own cross to carry that no man could carry. But yet he is, as a father with his children, taking care of these children, taking care of those disciples. And then it is here that the Lord gives them a very precious promise that the Holy Spirit is going to come and indwell you. He is with you but he shall be in you. And he promises them that his, his love will always be there so they can safely abide in his love. But Lord, aren't you going to die? What happens to your love? No, this love goes on forever. You can always find a place in my love. Abide in my love, the Lord tells them. 
he commands them that they would they need to abide in him and without abiding in him they cannot do anything and it also simply implies that if we do things without abiding in him doesn't count for much and then the lord says that if they abide in him they are going to bear much fruit and fruit that remains and as a result the father is going to be greatly glorified when we bear much fruit for his name's sake for his glory for his purposes and then the lord says in john 15 by this you will prove to be my disciples so i want to take a few moments just for us to think from the standpoint of the disciples if in a human sense you would see your loved one your leader nailed to a cross completely battered as they would have seen him in a few hours this lord who was with them in a private room in the upper room would now be dragged publicly he would be flogged he would be spat upon he would be beaten there would be a crown of thorns nailed to his head and then he would finally be hung on a cross to die in public shame and in a in a manner that is beyond our understanding not only shame but pain and agony rejected by man and as we sing in a him and of god to forsaken what would it do to these disciples as they saw this lord of glory who had done all these wonderful things before them who could raise the dead back to life who was transfigured on the mount and his glory was so great that they fell in terror such a lord would hang to death on a cross can any mortal describe the sufferings of the lord i don't think it is possible but as we go to be with the lord i believe that we will have a deeper understanding of his love and even here as we look forward to his coming every day we can go deeper in the love that he has for us in the understanding of his sufferings for us he gave his all to redeem you and me he loved us so much and so what happened as the lord hung to death on the cross what happened to this little group we know they were afraid and they locked themselves but if you fast forward the timeline we don't see that this group disbanded we don't see that the lord simply disappeared that was not the end and let me remind all of us that the lord has never gone into a battle that he has lost his people have lost and that would be because of their sin but the lord has never gone into a battle that he has lost and if he died it is because of his love for us as is written in 1 john he came to destroy the works of the devil through death he destroyed him that had the power of death and by the grace of god he tasted death for all men this was god's perfect plan and as peter would boldly proclaim in acts chapter 2 verse 24 it was impossible for death to hold him down he rose again praise the lord hallelujah conqueror over death the father brought him back to life and today he is seated at the right hand of that father about whom we shall read a few things and he has a name that is above every name and at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that will happen to each of us when we see him in glory it's a privilege to already acknowledge him and do that while we are here on earth but there comes a time for all those who rejected him to see him face to face and acknowledge him as lord before taking their place in eternal condemnation so come behold the glory of the risen lord so in these in these few chapters what we are given is an invitation to come into that room where the lord jesus is speaking to those disciples and i think the best best way we could uh, experience this is to imagine us being one of them actually whatever the lord spoke was not just for those 11 disciples but it was for for the rest of us so that we would know what his thoughts were and he has given very clear instructions they look very simple on the surface but how deep are these thoughts that the lord shared with his disciples and we seek 
by the help of the Holy Spirit to solemnly enter that sacred space and listen to the Savior as he's talking to the disciples. As he does a few things and reveals himself some more in those final hours to those disciples. The disciples could not understand everything that was coming upon them. All they knew that the Lord is going to be taken away. And they were sad. They were confused. And then on top of that, the Lord told them that one of you will betray me. And they were all troubled. Lord, what are you saying? They wanted to know who it was. And then the Lord told Peter when he boasted, I'm going to be with you. That night, the Lord told that you're going to deny me publicly three times. How, what a state of weakness all these disciples found themselves. But you see, the Lord dealt with them in love as he does with us. He did not reject them. He restored them. He strengthened them. All of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they put a microscope on the final days of our Lord's ministry on earth, leading up to his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And all the gospels ultimately show that the Son of God is the risen Savior, the conqueror over death. No matter how high-tech our technology becomes, how advanced our medical science will be, as long as we are plagued by sin, there will be death. And there is only one person who has conquered death. And in him, we too will conquer. And that is the Lord Jesus. And so when you look at the events, the last few hours of the Lord Jesus, for the disciples, it felt like everything was going out of control. Peter tried to take matters into his hands. His intentions were good. He wanted to protect the Lord. But no, the Lord's plans were different. And we see that everything went exactly as the Lord determined or predetermined or as the Lord deemed from before time began, from before the foundation of the world, the slain Lamb of God. We see his resurrection, ascension, glorification, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, the gates of hell will not prevail. And so this very Peter, later in Pentecost and later on, he keeps reminding the Jewish people that the one whom you crucified, this was God's plan. God delivered him up. And Paul uses that same phrase. So let us not consider the death of the Lord Jesus as a tragedy, but this was his expression of love to deliver us. Romans 5 verse 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so every Sunday, as believers, we come together to remember the death of the Lord Jesus, not as a historical tragedy, but as an amazing expression of God's love that made a way for us to be his eternally, to still prove that God is holy and that God is love. God is truly love. And so what we are going to do in the next uh, few sessions, as the Lord enables I would request your prayers. It is beyond me to go into the depths of everything. I'm constrained by my understanding. So I seek the help of the Holy Spirit. So I would appreciate your prayers as we go through the study. Uh, John chapter 13 through 17 is what I just want to put before you as the outline. And I think we will run out of time. So let me uh, keep moving here. In John chapter 13, I just read the verse and we will not read anymore due to the lack of time. We know that as the disciples understood that the Lord might be taken away, though they didn't understand all of the circumstances, there was an argument between them. They often debated between them, who among us is the greatest? It is in that kind of a situation that the Lord tells them some things that we find in other gospels. But in the gospel of John, we see a very profound action of the Lord, which is to wash the feet of his disciples. The, the way John describes it, he has been an eyewitness. And remember, he was one of the three disciples who were very close to the Lord, watching almost every move of his. And John writes in such striking details. First of all, he says that, he loved us unto the end. And then he says how he describes the manner in which as a supper was ended, the Lord rose up. He rose up to do what? 
he just took on immediately the visible form of his lowly servant. And he started to wash their feet. This must have shocked them at a time when they were debating who among them is the greatest. The Lord is doing something that's unthinkable. It is beyond their own dignity. And so Peter, out of good intention again, says, Lord, you will not wash my feet. It's, I can't bear this. And then the Lord admonishes him and says, if, if I don't clean you, you have no part with me. It was talking about fellowship, not eternal life. So there we see the Lord demonstrating to the disciples something that was beyond them. I love the quote that I saw uh, somewhere that it says that the form of God uh, in the visible form of a servant, the form of God was not exchanged for the form of a servant. Instead, the form of God was revealed in the form of a servant. And we read that in Philippians chapter two, what a beautiful description and time would not permit us to read that. I had it on my mind to read, but just look at that example of the Lord Jesus. It set the tone for the rest of the conversation from John 13 through 17. And the disciples must have been rattled. This is not usual for the Lord of glory to wash their feet. And then the Lord tells them about uh, in, in a symbol that they were to understand later that this is the sanctification work that the Lord does to all of his disciples. And if we don't allow him to do that, we have no fellowship with him is, the, is one of the messages. The other, the Lord says, I have shown you an example that you do this to one another. Serve one another with humility of mind. And Paul would pick it up in Philippians chapter two. We will not read all of it, but Paul says that, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant. And I know uh, on the TRC, uh, study series you have covered in the book of Isaiah, the uh, sessions on the perfect servant, Jehovah's servant, the suffering servant, the obedient servant, the one who brought delight, but he's a servant. And that is what we see here in John 13. Since the time I understood it, I have never been able to get over the fact of what the Lord did in that room to those disciples. That must set the tone for our service in the Lord's kingdom. So we see a few things, the Lord washing the feet of the disciples. And John does not mention one detail. That also must have been shocking for the disciples. As he broke bread, that was Passover. And they've celebrated as Jewish people for hundreds of years. And the Lord himself kept the Passover with the disciples. But what do we see? The Lord takes the bread and says that this is my body, which is given for you, broken for you. And then with the wine, he says that this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. The whole meaning of Passover changed. Until then, they had to get a lamb or some kind of a meat. These days, Jewish people don't keep a lamb. They have some, kind, some substitute meat. But here, the Lamb of God says that this is about me. Must have shocked those Jewish disciples who had kept that religious festival observance for years together and for millennia. And then we see the Lord Jesus in this meek and lowly and humble form, obedient to the Father. But we, will not, we don't have time, so I will move on. The Lord Jesus teaches the disciples to follow his example. I don't think we need very many teachers when we have the Lord as our teacher. All of us, all of the teachers can help us but our perfect example is the Lord Jesus himself. Look to him. We need his mind. We need his attitude. We need him, more of him in us. And as John would say, less of me, I must decrease. He must increase. As Paul would say, not I, but Christ lives in me. May it not be us, but may Christ be magnified. So the Lord teaches the disciples to follow his example. And this we know. Um, uh, John also writes about the example of the Lord, about his sinless perfection, 
about living in the light. And Peter picks up that example about suffering, saying that you know the suffering of the Lord, the suffering that he endured, leaving us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. So I want to uh, mention very, uh, want to emphasize that everything that the Lord did in those final hours, John says, he loved us to the uttermost, which means that till his final breath, as he was obedient to the Father, he loved those disciples. Praise God, those disciples recognized it and they never left the faith. We don't read about that. We see that they all ended up giving their lives for the Lord. That understanding is important for us also in today's service to the Lord, how much he loves us. And then I like the way John often refers to himself as the one, the disciple whom the Lord loved. The one who knows us best loves us the most. I don't think anybody can love me after they know everything about me, but I know that the Lord does. And that love draws me to him. It changes me. It transforms me. That love was demonstrated on the cross. And John writes later in 1 John, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his life a propitiation, a ransom for us. And then another place he says, we love him because he first loved us. It started with him. God is love, John writes. And then in 1 John chapter 3, behold what manner of love, what manner of love the Father had bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. That love demonstrated, manifested through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we would flip the pages to go to Revelation chapter 1, it's beautifully mentioned when John sees the Lord in all his glory in Revelation 1. He still uses the phrase, unto him who loved us, or it's more a present tense, unto him who loves us. On the throne, he still loves us and cares for us. What a loving Savior we have. We all have equal access to this Savior. He is the vine, and we are called to abide in him. This is how the Lord Jesus wants us to know him, that he loves us. And John understood that. That's why he writes that in his uh, gospels over and over again, the one whom Jesus loved. The Lord later in that chapter foretells his betrayal by uh, Judas. And then after that, since there's no time, I'm just going to skip uh, and move on. Judas exits the room into the night. We find that somewhere towards the end of chapter 13, towards the middle uh, second half. And then the Lord reveals himself to the disciples. The first thing he says, now is the son of man glorified. You know how that verse 31 starts? Therefore, when he was gone out, when Judas was gone, after the Lord washed his feet, after he gave him umpteen opportunities to turn to him. When Judas had determined, as Satan put in his heart, to betray the Lord. And as he went out, never to come back. The Lord now tells the disciples, now is the Son of Man glorified. and God is glorified in him. He says that now the time has come to glorify God. Can we understand the depth of this word? The Lord was not talking about another spectacular display of glory, but he was talking about his own death, how he would glorify all that God is in his death. He would demonstrate the depth of God's love, his mercy, and his love, and his grace, abundant grace that we cannot exhaust, the exceeding riches of his grace, and his perfect justice all met in this great work, which was hours away. And then the Lord says, now is the Son of Man glorified, God is glorified in him. And right there, the Lord says, I'm giving you a new commandment. It is to love. If we are believers, if we confess and profess to follow this Lord who was characterized by love, we cannot but love in truth, in, in deed, not just with lips. May the Lord help us to love those who are in our sphere of influence, to truly love them not the one of pretension, but as the Lord loved, that we should love one another. That's the new commandment. And then that chapter ends 
with the Lord foretelling Peter's denial. That must have been shocking for Peter. I don't think Peter said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to deny you. That's correct. No, he couldn't believe it. He said, not possible. And he was willing to defend the Lord. But that day, that night, Peter's strength was found wanting. But the Lord had compassion on him. The Lord looked at him while Peter had denied and the rooster crowed. Peter looked at the Lord. The Lord looked at him. And then Peter went out and wept bitterly, we know. But the Lord restored Peter. And he became one of the great leaders of the early church. We know that. I see that my time is up. I wanted to provide. Um, and you might wonder, why are we going through John 13 and 14? I hope by now you've understood. Uh, I don't intend to simply go into John 15 and then tell he's the wine, we are the branches, and end it there. No, look at the wine. The one who says that I'm the wine, his glory is so great. And then he makes it absolutely simple and says, I am the wine, you are the branches abide in me. And that's why we are working our way through chapter 13. And I also want to mention a few things from chapter 14 in the few minutes that are ahead of us. And we'll pick up John 15, Lord willing, in our next session. John 14 is so, so precious. It's probably the most read passages when people go through trouble, especially the disciples of the Lord. The Lord comforts them saying that, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, just like you believe in God, believe in me. You might not see me, but believe in me. And he's strengthening those disciples. And he's giving them hope that he will come back. So our time of separation, physical separation from the Lord is not forever. He is coming back. We hold on to that promise. He's coming back. And then these are moments before going to the cross. The Lord provides a deeper understanding of himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I find that very precious that the Lord was patiently answering many questions. Have you noticed if you have a red letter Bible, you will notice from the end of chapter 13, Simon Peter is asking a question that, Lord, where are you going? And then the Lord has a conversation with Simon Peter. Then in chapter 14, verse 5, Thomas is asking a question. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then the Lord is patiently answering him as a loving father, as a friend. He's comforting them as their Lord and master. He's taking care of them, strengthening them, giving them the right understanding of who he is. And then in verse 8, Philip asked the question, or he says, Lord, Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. It'll be enough for us. Then the Lord again very patiently says to Philip, have I been so long time with you and yet you have known, not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And Lord willing, we will talk about that in the next class. The relationship of the Lord Jesus to his Father. It's an example for us how we ought to abide in him. And then... The Lord in the verses in John 14 particularly reveals his relationship with the Father. And he gives them a very precious promise that another comforter, just like me, he is going to come and he will indwell. He will indwell uh, you. He will be in you. So I see that my uh, time is almost up and I will conclude here in a minute. He gives us his peace. The Lord Jesus told those troubled disciples that I'm going to give you my peace. My peace, not as the world gives. It's real. So may the Lord help us uh, that if, if time allows, please read John chapter 13, 14, and 15. We will be primarily in John 15, Lord willing, in our next class. May the Lord help us. But we will see his glory and that we will be drawn to him and we will keep his commandments. His commandment is to love one another. His commandment is to abide in him so that we can bear much fruit for his glory. Yeah, I would conclude here. The Lord help us uh, to continue in the next session. Thank you. May God's